Morgan Neville joins me here in Studio Q. Hello again. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, so what's the focus of this particular look at Keith Richards? What was so great about this was we started with no focus. <laughs> it, this was a complete accident. And in fact, I think that's the only way this film ever came into existence. I heard it started with you bringing some records over to Keith Richards' place. Yeah, so that was the first thing Jane Rose, Keith's longtime manager, said, you know, we want somebody to interview Keith. Would you come talk to Keith? And I think before she finished her sentence, I said, yes, yes, I would love to come talk to Keith. And um, and we were talking, I, first I heard um, what the music he was working on, and I heard all these different influences. I heard jazz and soul and, of course, electric blues and acoustic blues and country and all the music that you hear through the Stones music. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, why don't I just bring a giant pile of albums and a turntable and we'll just talk about music, which I did for three hours. Which is a Stones fan's dream. I, yeah. If I could have told my 14-year-old self that one day I'd be sitting around <laughs> spinning records with Keith Richards, I really thought I would have been out of my head. So this new solo record he was working on was called Cross-Eyed Heart? Is that right? It is. It yeah. is. And, but it, like I said, we didn't actually intend to make a documentary. We didn't know what we were doing. And it was one of these things that, um, in fact, Jane, his manager, said, You're not going to make a documentary. Let's just do this. And we kept filming and we had such a good time. And I think Keith had a great time because this is what Keith likes to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. And that was part of it is, you know, rather than me coming in there with an agenda, let's just hang out and talk. And in a way, I think the thing the film does best is it gives you a really real sense of who this guy is, what it would be like to sit around with him and talk about life and talk about music. So 14-year-old Morgan Neville's yeah. dream come true. What did you discover about him as a person in that first encounter? Well, it's amazing because Keith has such a persona. You know, it's the sunglasses and the sig and kind of half-stoned, leaning against a wall. Mm -hmm. And I think part of what the book started to do was make you realize that there was more than that cardboard persona to him, that he's actually somebody that was one of the greatest songwriters of the 20th century. You forget that. Yeah. You forget that he was part of one of the greatest bands of all time. And um, part of what struck me instantly was that he was one of the most charming people I'd ever met. He was incredibly funny. Mm. And, um, and he was just really generous and warm. Mm. And so in a way, I just wanted to kind of capture that feeling. And he's one of those people too. I mean, I've filmed a lot of different people, but it made not one iota of difference if there was a camera there or not. He you was know, the same guy. He was exactly the same person. So when people ask me, what was he really like? I say, well, watch the film. That's what he's really like. You talked about hearing his influences in the new solo record. For him, it all starts with this transatlantic musical love affair, right? Why was American music so important for young Keith, even as he grew up miles away in Southeast England? It's interesting because, you know, he was getting just glimpses of it, sometimes from the BBC, sometimes from the pirate radio stations that were on ships off the coast of England broadcasting whatever they wanted. And um, I think it was that promise of uh, this, you know, Never Never Land called America with this incredible music. And it wasn't just the blues. I mean, Keith talked a lot about the influence of the blues. But part of what we get into is it was... Uh, Elvis Presley and Dean Martin and Hank Williams and Johnny Cash and all these different things that were coming over the the, uh, the radio waves. And not only that, it was American culture. You know, it was watching mm -hmm. uh, John Wayne movies and, and all of these things, Shane, you know, things that uh, for a young kid in black and white post-war England yeah. kind of blew his mind. The Stones did cover, I mean, the, the love affair with the blues is, is well documented. They covered a lot of American blues artists in the band's early years. Your film shows that the band in turn had an influence on American music, obviously, and some of these very blues artists that influenced them. How yeah, so? Yeah, absolutely. You're hearing that version right there. That's about 10 times faster than Muddy's original version of <laughs> that song. And, you know, on, on the one hand, you know, they were taking this music they loved, Helen Wolf and uh, Bo Diddley and, and Muddy, and, um, and doing covers of it and doing original songs that were influenced by it. And, um, you know, I think it's very easy to say they exploited it and, uh, you know, got famous off of it. But one thing that came through loud and clear uh, was that it changed the lives of those guys too. Because mm -hmm. um, by the early 60s, that 
ch- Chicago blues sound that they loved wasn't selling anymore, and they were going through a hard time. And Muddy and Helen Wolf and and uh, Bo Diddley and Buddy Guy, uh, who's in the film, are explicitly clear that they were so thankful yeah. that the Stones came along and did this. And the Stones did it from a place of sheer love. You know, there's no doubt when you see Keith talking about the blues that it's the thing he's always wanted to embody. There is a bit in the film where Keith is talking about his first time visiting the American South as a bit of an outsider from all of that tension. I mean, it's impossible to talk about the blues and rock and roll without talking about race. And that was such an interesting uh, point in the film. Well, again, he had the outsider's point of view on it. And so when he finally went to the South on tour, on sometimes on... um, packages where they were they were black and white acts mixed together that uh you know they would encounter these things they'd only heard about about uh different drinking fountains and all these things and having problems with where they were staying mm. and Keith feeling the kinship with you know these black musicians on the tour who he wanted to hang out with and he wasn't allowed to to um to dine with them at times and I think that was kind of a rude awakening to him and I think again it's some it's that kind of um color blindness um, that he really, really embodied. I mean, it's not just blindness. It's that he he wanted to be an old black blues singer when mm-hmm. he was 18. And he's kind of succeeded at this point. He's gotten pretty far down that path. Did anything strike you about those conversations you were having about those, some of those early experiences with race in America for Keith? Yeah, I mean, I think um, America blew their minds in so many different ways. Uh, we took Keith back to Chicago. And Chicago was the the mythic uh, land of Oz. You know, that that was the city he wanted to go to, the Emerald City. Um, you know, and all they knew about were um, slaughter yards and Al Capone uh, and this amazing music. Mm. And everybody thought they were crazy because they just kept saying, we want to go to Chicago. And, um, and when they got there, uh, it wasn't what they were expecting. You know, they, they got to meet their heroes, but their heroes um, were still living hand to mouth. Um, you know, Muddy and Wolf were just playing tiny little clubs on the south side of Chicago mm-hmm. and eking out a living at that point. And they recorded at Chess on that first tour of America. That was like their big goal was mm-hmm. to go. And I, they recorded um, It's All Over Now there at Chess, which was one of their uh, their first hits. You've profiled so many incredible musicians. What struck you about Keith's connection to music? The thing you forget is that rock stars have their own rock stars. You know, you forget that this first generation of rock stars didn't grow up in a vacuum. Um, there are people they look up to in the same way that people look up to Keith or Mick or the Beatles or whomever uh, mm-hmm. their heroes are. And part of what was fun for me was seeing him talk about his idols. And in a way, it, you know, you see the young Keith in those moments where he's talking about these people that he just can't believe he ever got a chance to to meet them and sometimes play with them and um, sometimes become friends with them. Hmm. And I think that's just a side of of Keith you don't see much of. His connection to music in the film seems almost like physical, like it's like it's literally a part of him. Is that something you notice as well? Yeah, I mean, th- there was a story um, that a friend of his told me that Keith had told him a long time ago, uh, maybe 25 years ago. And in a way, it seemed like the perfect metaphor for Keith's relationship with music, which is he describes music as the eye of a hurricane and it's a place of solitude and peace and a place um, where he tries to remain. And he said, if I leave that circle just a few feet, there are winds blowing hundreds of miles an hour. They're going to pull me away and they're going to be destructive. And what I've learned in life is to stay inside the circle. And it's that circle of music that, that has been the one thing in his life that's never betrayed him. It's been true to him. It's nurtured him. And I understand why it's, it's kind of his religion. I'd imagine you would understand because, as I said, you've profiled so many great musicians. What makes you want to continually examine music? I mean, I, I think I'm also maybe a member of the Church of Music, too. So um, I think music is a way to tell all kinds of stories. I mean, I think as a filmmaker, it's incredible because... You get to use this music, which brings with it history and nostalgia and familiarity and culture, all these all things. things. It's just an incredible tool. But once you bring an audience in with the music, you can tell any kind of story you want. And I feel like all of my music films are actually both about music, but about something else. Mm-hmm. And whether that's um, civil rights or gender or 
fame or whatever it is, uh, it allows you an incredible tool to tell a different kind of story. What's your favorite story of your time with Keith? Um, there's a moment in the film that was something I really wanted to do as a Stones fan was um, – the Street Fighting Man was always one of my favorite Stones songs. Mm -hmm. And I had always heard about how they had recorded it uh, with just Charlie and Keith uh, doing all the music. And that Keith, there are no electric guitars on the song. It's him playing an acoustic guitar through a tiny little 60s Norelco tape recorder that had no um, governor on it, no uh, compression limiter. Mm -hmm. So it just overdro overdrove into this kind of electric sound. And um, we found one of those old tape recorders and we surprised him with it and we got him to reenact the making of Street Fighting Man. And uh, yeah, for me- He must've loved that too. He did, it yeah. was amazing. Yeah, I mean, I, and it worked. That's the thing, that the sound coming out of that little tape recorder with Keith on his guitar, it sounded like that Street Fighting Man sound. Amazing. Uh, must've been a surreal experience. Congratulations on the film. Thanks so much.